good afternoon to you all. And I'm really thankful to Professor Michelle Danino for inviting me here and for giving such a generous introduction. Um, I think I'll be use the... So as you can see from my, uh, it was he who pointed out that I could uh, talk on some aspects of society of early India. And uh, when uh, he invited me to give this, to this uh, series of lectures, then I thought that uh, early India, it is important to actually make a point that uh, when we talk about the social life of early India or the society of early India, it is just not caste. So we have many other aspects that we can delve upon when we are understand, trying to understand the society or the social life. So I thought that we can talk about the everyday life, uh, which has not been dealt upon much in uh, the historical studies of early India. And though we have persons like Janine Aubert, who, st who actually we have a book by her, uh, Daily Life in Ancient India, but that covered um, rather a a longer period and the different kinds of it was more on the uh, on social his, uh, on the history of society than actually focusing on the daily life so that was one thing which uh, came to my mind and i decided that i might be talking about this and i've chosen bengal because this is my area of study i have looked at the sources from bengal and i come from bengal so it is easier for me to handle the sources as you know that ancient india's uh, inscriptions the epigraphic data are so vast and it is not possible to cover all the regions in this small uh, poem, uh, time frame and it is better to work on something which I actually, on a region which I am familiar with. Now, before I begin or before I uh, start talking about the everyday life, what I thought that uh, since it is a, uh, I know about the persons with whom I'm interacting more or less, so I thought that it would be great to have some discussions on the different kinds of sources that I'll be using. And I will not be restricting myself only to epigraphy, though I use epigraphy a lot in, or for my other studies, and tomorrow you will be seeing that I will focus morely on, mostly on epigraphy. But here I have chosen to use, because when I was uh, use epigraphy, art historical epigraphy, much lesser, art historical material, textual sources, and a little bit of field archeological materials. Because this is what actually, when we talk of understanding, and we use the word understanding carefully because we are actually trying to understand how early in the everyday life was in the earlier period. And therefore, um, I thought of talking about the sources a little bit. And when we think of the sources, uh, this is a very interesting image. And I, some of you must have uh, seen this image. This is a small terracotta tablet found from Sug in Haryana. And you can see that in this tablet, you a, a child, it's, a, it's actually a child who is holding this tablet. And here you have something written in. This is the first historical, like archeological documentation of a child's slate, like we have this board. So it's a writing board used by a child which has been depicted in art historical material from Sug, which is in Haryana. Sug is located in, in a place where we have a lot of early historical find, uh, findings. So near Sug, we have some very important sites of the Yodhyas who were a Ghana uh, Republic or a Ghana Shanga type of people. We have different kinds of like um, uh, excavation material from uh, these regions. So it's very important and this Sug uh, terracotta was highlighted a lot because it gives us an idea of the kind of material, writing board, perhaps they were using in that period of time. The second thing with for epigraphy, I thought that this is also very important because this is from Gandhara, but here you have the Buddha, he is writing on a board. And what is interesting, if you can look at, just have a look at it properly, he's writing not from left to right, as we write in Karoshti, uh, Brahmi, but is writing from right to left. And this is actually, so see, he's not writing from here. His, his stylus is here. 
So he's writing from right to left, which was very much there in the Karoshti writing of Karoshti. And Karoshti was a script that was used in the northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent. And this tablet comes from Gandhara. So naturally, it was, it had its impact on the writing, the script. And so perhaps here, Buddha is depicted to be writing in Karoshti. So to begin with, I, I thought that it would be useful to so show these slides to see how epigraphic writing had actually came into being. Now going to my own topic of everyday life, what um, we find that when we talk of every life in society, like social life, then we have that, uh, we find that in these days, it has emerged as a sub-discipline. Uh, as I was mentioning that now we have some kind of uh, studies in everyday life. Before, if you had looked into earlier books, you never had this chapter on da daily life so much uh, with a focus. But now, books are coming out and people are having writing, when they're writing history books, they're having some kind of at least a paragraph or a chapter on everyday life. So it is a, what is everyday life? It's a, like every day what we do what we eat, what we wear, everything comes under the purview of everyday life. So, but it's not possible to actually uh, get everything together because the sources, as uh, Professor Danino mentioned, that for early India, our main constraint is the paucity of sources. We are limited by our sources. So what we do is whatever kind of sources that we get, mostly not very explicit, largely implicit, but then we can draw upon these sources and try to understand how those people so many years ago actually lived. And therefore, there are certain sections, like I'm talking about, um, uh, I'll bring in the household also in this whole idea of everyday life, that what kind of houses, what was the basic plan of the houses of some people who were living in this period of time. So it is actually a complex mosaic of events at seen I've written, which, when, uh, which moments and activities which actually uh, give a uh, framework to the society. And of course, it is every day, the quotidian. So the social reality is grounded in the quotidian, and therefore you have this, with the passage of time, it also changes, but uh, slowly. Now, in the historic context, when we talk of this writing of everyday life, history of light, um, a little bit of, I think, an overview of historiographical issues would be uh, quite in order. And therefore, um, when I'm talking of uh, uh, the history of writing everyday life, we see that the concern for everyday life was understood as a general part of rejection of grand narratives. And it came from France, the Annal School. They actually tried to bring in different aspects of society in the writing of history. Therefore, from France, we have the history of climate. We have a wonderful books by Leroy Laduri, who talks about the history of a village. Or there are records which talk about history of suicides in a village. These kind of studies were not done earlier in our uh, country. So it is the very strong influence of the Annal School of France, which actually uh, instigated people to take up this kind of works. So when we talk about that a large body of historical writing has made everyday life, the experiences, actions, and habits of ordinary people a legitimate obje uh, object of historical uh, in uh, inquiry. And therefore, we have expressions like la vie quotidienne in France, or la vida privada and the alter geschicht, all used for explaining da daily life. And as soon as the, fra fra uh, the Annal School took up, then we had scholars in Germany, we had scholars, scholars in Italy, who were actually working on uh, these things. And to name the person who brought in the idea of everyday life in a very structured way was, of course, Fernand Brodel. So the structure of everyday life, this was the book uh, which Brodel wrote, and where he showed that whenever we are looking at something, day-to-day -day activities, daily life, then it actually falls within a particular structure. 
very plainly, we get up every day, we have breakfast, we have lunch, we have dinner, we go for office, we go for school. So these are, these are the basic things of everyday life which are structured. And it continues with a long durée. But beyond these structures or within these structures, we have certain moments which are important for us. And those moments have been recorded in historical documents. And from those moments, we can actually understand what uh, we think of the life that the earlier people lived. And he's using this, we all know about Fernand Brothers' very famous idea of long durée, that it continued, something continued for a longer time and how we can understand. So the structure pervades the society at all its level and characterizes ways of being and behaving which are perpetuated through endless ages. This is a quote from Brodel. Thus Brodel defined everyday life as consisting of the little things that one hardly notices in time and space. Or to put differently, to understand everydayness, attention to small components is imperative. So there was, here was this distinction between the meta history or the mega history, which historians were doing at that point of time, and then shifting into the small components of life, which actually could give us a clear idea how ordinary people lived. And here also, I'd like to point out then we generally don't get much on the common people for early India. When Brodel was writing about France, he had a lot of information from the, from, for, about the common people from the French historians. But for early India, we have very little information because if you look at our sources, the sources are the elite sources. Who talks about a common man? Which source talks about a common man? Only from archaeological material sometimes we get a pot shirt can talk about what the common man is eating on or some archaeological factors or the structure of houses. But basically when we talk of inscriptions, these are royal inscriptions or donative records, but donative records do not give us an idea of everyday life. We have literature. We have beautiful descriptions of life from literary texts. But here also mostly the elites are described. So these are the problems that we encounter when we talk about everyday life of people. So it is sometimes not the everyday life of common people. It is sometimes the everyday life of people who are in the upper echelons of the society. But in some cases, we are quite lucky. For example, in case of Bengal, we have a text called Charyapada, Charyapada or Charyapada, which gives us, it's an 11th, 12th century text, which is written by uh, the people belonging to the lower strata of the society. Uh, it talks about this lower strata of the society, the Dombis, the Shabaras, and others who are in the fringe area of the society and through songs and it is much more into the kind of um, uh, like it was uh, written to in form of songs and it gives us some idea of the kind of lives this common people lived in early medieval Bengal, particularly in Western Bengal and in some parts of Eastern Bengal. Uh, now, when we look at uh, uh, everyday life, of course, house is important. Where do we stay? So it's the house and the household. It is very uh, important, and so it is imperative to take into account the household, which is a crucial space. We are talking about the spaces, different spaces where we inhabit. So household is a crucial pla uh, place which makes, uh, which much of the daily activities must have taken place. Now, how, the question is, how did the crucial space look like? Uh, we have fragmentary ideas in this regard from excavations or some vague descriptions in texts or just reference to some components of a house. So like, uh, I'll come to that later on, an inscription talks about Parker Griha, which is the kitchen. So you have, in that particular inscription, you have description of different kinds of rooms that were there in a house. But these are very rare and they have one or two examples. So. Um, Fragmentary evidences are there, and from fragmentary evidence, we are building up, trying to build up a whole to get an idea of these things. For the sources, for understanding the household, that what could be the sources for household? Uh, here again, the same problem comes in, that with the household of the higher Varna of the, or the elite, yet 
in those writings of the higher varnas, for example, Manusmriti. Manusmriti talks about the higher varnas, but of course refers to some kind of uh, staying place for a chandala. So we have an idea where does a chandala stay. So this kind of, or the pattern of living of a shudra. Thus we have texts like Grijya Sutra. Sutra literature, actually we come after the Vedic texts. We have the sutra literatures. And we have Pat Patrick Oliver who has done very good work on the sutra literatures. So they were composed in, the, as you can see, in the first millennium BC. And um, though they represented uh, Vedic Orthodox views, they can be used in the study of everyday life because uh, we have here, uh, I, I'll come to that, we have in the sutra literature the description of what you, when you get up in the morning, what are the rituals that you have to perform. And these were the everyday rituals. You can't get away with it. So it gives us an idea of the everyday life once again. Then you have the Kama Sutra, which is a much later text written around 3rd, 4th century uh, CE. But it's, and, um, and, it, and it helps us in understanding the household of an urban male. So you have this term called, Na Kama Sutra talks a lot about Nagaraka. So Nagaraka is a man about town who is going around, he is very flippant, he has a very luxurious style of living, and it gives, the text gives us a very beautiful description of his household and how he lived his life. So, but this again was, uh, should not be taken as a very con common, like every people lived like, live like a, like a Nagaraka, which is described in the text. But an urban male, how did an urban male look like? Or how did an urban male dress himself? How did an urban male live? This we can understand from the Kama Sutra. So this source I have used a little bit, not much, but little bit to understand the uh, everyday life. <clears throat> then we have the, of course, Manusmriti uh, is earlier than Kama Sutra, and which is composed between 2nd century BC and 2nd century CE, which has, again, greater trust on the performance of daily rituals of, uh, by the householder. <clears throat> now, when we look at the Grijya Sutras, we have this description of the household and its daily activities. It projects that what is a house that is griha, and griha is a sacred space. It's a space where actually you perform, you stay and you perform certain rituals. So everyday rituals of the household attempt to create an aura about everyday common events by according to them with sacrality. The setting of the rites, the time of the year, this is very important, that when we have which kind of rites, the time of the day, you cannot do such performances in some, any time you like. You have some are restricted to morning, some to the, uh, to the other times of the day, the sacrificial appendages, and so you have the physical aspects. What I'm trying to say is that when you look at the, when they read the Grijya Sutras, you know that you have to, every day you have to get up and do this kind of thing. So each of the people, People who were actually performing these rituals, they had to do regularly at a certain prescribed time in a certain prescribed form. So there was a kind of a tension also. If you look at it, if you have to do everything every day, same things in the same time, then again there is a kind of a tension. But if we look over, look through the tension, then we find that there was a norm in it. So there was a structure, the structure which Brodel talked about, the structure of everyday life. So there was also a structure which continued. The Grijya Sutras were written so long, but in like in the re regular rituals, even through the Manusmritis and others, this um, structure continued. Then within the domestic rites, there are certain obligatory rituals which were performed on a daily basis, such as Pancha Mahayagya. This is the five great sacrifices that you perform, and these are daily uh, like observances. And very significantly, we have this term added to this called Nitya. Nitya means, again, every day. You have to do this every day, and uh, which was supposed to be performed by a householder. And the idea of Panchamahayaga for a Brahmana like Boli, Choru, uh, Vaishyadeva, Agnihotra, Atithi. Let me explain a little bit uh, this. Boli is actually some of this, uh, Atithi and others, you will, uh, all of you know. But let me talk a little bit about Boli. 
this is a very interesting term that has come up, that we find in Indian history and it had a changing connotations. Like when we had Bali, the term Bali in the Rig Veda, it was more a voluntary offering. It was not a tax. It was a kind of a voluntary offering to the king. Whatever you felt, you gave it to a tax, uh, to the king. Later on, in the later part of the Vedic um, Sanghitas, we find that Bali becomes a kind of an um, tax which has to be given. So the king is known and then it becomes obligatory and the king is known as Bali Rit, which means one who takes Haran, it's from the term is Haran, so Bali Rit, which means that one who takes away the Bali from you. So the king is here who is actually <coughs> trying to force you to give Bali, so a kind of a offering or tax like this. So these are, then, then we have later on Bali as a very important tax, uh, tax and so we have Bali, Bhaga, Shulka, so these became periodics like Bhaga was the tax, one sixth of the produce was, has to be given, so Bali became a periodic text in the later periods. So here we can see the changing connotation. But when here we have this Bali, it is actually a kind of an offering that is given to the God. So here this term is coming. Agnihotra, Vaishyadeva, these are all ritual practices and Atiti. Charu, we have, then well, there is another term which is not, I have not mentioned here. Sometimes for Atiti, then we have, instead of Atiti, Satra. Satra is a large gathering where you actually give uh, people to eat. So that is, sometimes you have the term like Bali, Charu, and Satra. You don't have the other things. Charu is like <coughs> the things that you are the uh, ritual components which are actually necessary to be given during the time of a ritual. Now, this is what we find from Brahmanical texts. This continues even in the later early medieval period when we have these inscriptions, the donative records, and there we find in the donative records that the king is donating a piece of land to a brahmana, and what he feels is that he has to, the, the income which will be accrued from that land, that land has to be used to perform the five mahayagyas, because the brahmana is supposed to do the five pancha mahayagya, that is uh, Bali, Charu, Satra, and other things. So there was, so this idea of this Pancha Mahayagya was very much there present even in the early medieval period, and that we find reflection, uh, reflected upon in the land grants. But if we see a completely divergent thing in the practice in Buddhism, when we look, so here we have a kind of a householder who is a Brahmana householder, who is practicing the Grijja Sutra rites, who is practicing the Pancha Mahayagya, but if we look to look at a person who is known in Buddhist texts as a Gahapati. Gahapati is different from a Grihapati. We have to be very careful in this. Grihapati is one who is the lord of the Griha, the house. Here, Gahapati, earlier there was a misconception that Gahapati could be, could, was only a householder. But this Gahapati here is not only a householder. He is the in possession of very rich agricultural lands. So he is in possession of large amount of lands and sometimes the Gahapati actually, with the money that he earns from the land, he uses that money for trade. So he becomes a Sreshti. Sreshti is a rich uh, merchant. So we have this category called Setti Gahapati. So a Gahapati becoming a Setti. Here we find that when we talk of Gahapati in the Buddhist text, that he is not, since it's a, he is more into Buddhism, so he's not asked to do this any kind of rituals, and his resources are mostly uh, rooted to vast land holdings. He was an urbane person. So his house is described to have a gabled roof. The sitting room is decorated with fine furniture, with a wash basin at the corner, a canopy hung. These we all come know from the uh, text with the seat of the Gahapati who enjoyed the fragrance of incense and was well served by his wives. So you have these kind of description that we find from the texts. 
Then taking you much later to Bengal, we have these two texts called Subhashita Ratna Kosha and the Vidyakaras, Adukti Karnamrita. And here we find these are all 10 to 12th centuries texts. And I must say that another point, difficulty in using the literature, using the textual sources is that sometimes we do not have, we have problem with the dating of this text. So we cannot very correctly uh, date the uh, text, but uh, most of the cases we have a rough understanding. So there, uh, like in uh, Shubhashita Ratna Kosho and the Sadukti Karmata, they give descriptions of the layout of the residences. I, I mentioned that we do not have how a house looked, an idea of how a house looked like, even not even from archaeology uh, per se, like we have one room, two room, but if you think of uh, like how you, whether there was a bedroom, a sitting room, and how it was. But you, in the text, we have this description where it is said that a woman is coming out of the center of the house. So she is coming of the center, then to the front hall. So you have a room, if you can recreate it, then to the front hall, and then stepping out to the courtyard, thus giving a picturesque view of the physical components of a contemporary household. But of course, we have to remember this contemporary household is of an elite, not of a common man. So that the well-to-do people built big houses with well-laid-out courtyard and gardens, of course, as in early uh, now too. And I mentioned this uh, source called Charjahapada, and uh, these charya songs. And here we find that which give us an idea of the domestic units of the poorer. While, uh, and they were quite austere because if you like uh, the term which is written in actually it's, uh, some, some sort of Bangla, the talat mor ghar nahi paraveshi, that my house is on the hilltop and I have no neighbors. I'm alone, I'm secluded, where there are no neighbors on the fringes of a settled society. So it's a poignant description of seclusion and marginality because he doesn't live with all uh, with many people and this actually tally well with the manusmriti when we have the references and particularly these people the people who is talking here the talot morghar he is actually a domba he is a, a, dom, a dombi who helps in the cremation so here we find that Manu says that the lower communities should live by well-known trees and in cemeteries, hills and groves, which means in solitary and exclude, excluded places. Uh, I, I'll just uh, read out exactly what it says, that their property consists of dogs. Uh, it, Manu is talking about the chandalas. And their property consists of dogs and donkeys. Their garments are the clothes of the dead. They eat... Is, they eat in broken vessels, the ornaments are of iron, and they constantly roam about. Location of the household was solitary places. Either they roam about or they are in some, in another text, uh, it's on the fringes. So this is the sharp contrast that we found uh, from when we were looking at this text, that how Charyagiti de, uh, describes the house of a common man and how Subhashita Ratna Koshan, because these are of the contemporary times. That was also 11th, 12th century, and this is also 11th, Charyagiti is also 11th, 12th century. The, loca the locus is also Bengal. So in Bengal, you have this kind of stark contrastive categories in case of the households. Now, going back again a little uh, in point of time, I I'm actually constantly, normally as a student of history, we go always by chronology. But here, uh, for the purpose of making it more understandable, I thought that it's better to actually shuffle between times. So now I'm going back a little uh, in time and talking about the house of a Nagaraka. And in the house of a Nagaraka, uh, this is regard to the description of the outer room. We have this beautiful description that a lute hanging from an ivory tusk is there, a boat to draw or paint on, and a box of pencils, some book or other, and garlands of amaranth flower. On the floor, not too far away, a round bed with pillow for the head, a board for dice and a board of gambling. Now, when you read this, what impression do you get of a Nagaraka? He is a well-cultured man. He knows how to paint. So he, has, he also has musical affinities. So a lute is also there. And then, of course, he has a life which is uh, like of luxury. And uh, then 
his other pastimes, which is, could be, which is gambling, board of dice, and other things. Then again, if we look into the bedroom, and how uh, actually the uh, Vatsayana gives the details of the, uh, uh, the sphere of activity of, of, of when we have this outer room, and then we look at the bedroom. Then, in the and there are there are two different bedrooms. One is the outer bedroom, and one is the inner. So I'm talking about the outer bedroom. In the outer bedroom, there's a bed, low in the middle and very soft, with pillows on both sides and a white top sheet. There is also a couch. At the head of the bed, there's a grass mat and an altar on which are placed the oils and garlands left over from the night. A pot of beeswax, a vial of perfume, some bark from a lemon tree, and betel. And then comes in other descriptions. So when you have this, uh, these descriptions, you know the kind of luxurious life that a Nagaraka would have lived in and how the kind of uh, things, um, he, uh, the daily, his daily activities. But before coming to this, uh, I would like to read a little bit on the reference to the household of a Ganika. So when Nagaraka was the house, the man about the town, there is also the woman about the town. And how the woman about the town was looked at. So here, it's a, a little distinct from, the, from a Nagaraka. And uh, where located, um, their house always is not in the familial space, so it is located a little far away. And the, the inner chamber, and when we see the uh, description of a Nagaraka's house, the inner chamber is, of course, the domain of the wife, the private, private chamber. And interestingly, there uh, in Vatsana also does not give us any description, much description of the inner chamber. So he was more concentrating on the outer chamber. So the household of the... Uh, uh, of a courtesan when we find that it's not very uh, detailed, described in details, but the resources acquired that uh, she gets from the, from the Nagaraka or from other gifts, these are mentioned that these are there beautifully displayed in the houses and uh, it was uh, her, the space, her house, but not only her house, it was also the space for her work. So that is also being uh, given in details in the, uh, in the description of a Nagaraka in Kama Sutra. Now again, I'm moving into epigraphic um, material. And here, for the first time, we have a very detailed description of the layout of a house, where we find that the Bhattera copper plate inscription of Raja Gavinda Dev Keshava Deva. Bhattera is, I will, I will show you the map of Bengal, and you will know where it is located. It is Raja Govinda Keshava Deva. He was, this place, Bhattera, was in a territory called Silet in Bangladesh. And he was a very important ruler because originally Silet, this region, was under other regional rulers. And later on, they became, it became a Rajya, it became a, a kingdom. So from a mandala from an administrative area, Silet becomes a kingdom. So there you have this description which refers to dwelling sites, like it's called Basti. Uh, not the term Basti as we know or understand today, not in the sense of the slum, but Basti in the sense of a dwelling place. Outside house, that is the outer house, that is Vara Griha. Then houses, Griha. Then kitchen, Pakadite Griha. Kaushet, Go Griha. So, here we have actually what are the different components that we find in generally life of a, um, a person in a <coughs> town or a village. Now here this is the map of Bengal, undivided Bengal of course. And let me tell you, when we talk of Bengal, uh, of early India, there was no Bengal as per se. We did not have any Bengal. Bengal actually emerged in hist history from the period of the Sultanates, we were, the, as they were known as Bengal Sultans. It was, Bengal was a conglomeration or an agglomeration of certain subregions, and these subregions were, for example, Pundravardhana, Radha, 
Then you have this Harikela, which is present in the Chittagong region, Samatata, which is, uh, these are in Bangladesh, and the circle, these are actually, and this is Srihatta, Silet, which, where, from where we find, found this inscription. So Bengal, per se, did not exist at that point of time. But when I'm talking of that, I'm giving, try to give, trying to give an uh, idea of early, like daily life of early Bengal, I'm trying to incorporate sources or information that we get from different parts of this territory, uh, parts of the regions. And there are regional differences, but more or less, there was a broad commonality. So keeping that idea of broad commonality, and sometimes, for example, we are using, uh, for understanding the life of a town, town man, we are using the man about town, we are using the Kama Sutra, because Kama Sutra, uh, we do not know exactly where it was written, but it is taken to be written in some part in uh, Magadha or in the Eastern India. So it has, like, the idea of what we, that we get from the Kama Sutra should have been also present in the... Uh, region of Bengal. Now a little bit of historiographical issues that who actually when we are tr limited uh, by our sources as I said what actually happened. Uh, I have already mentioned that and I'm not going into the details of that and uh, it was I would I should mention Niharanjan Ray who was a famous historian art historian of early India so he was not a historian only of Bengal. He was a very famous art historian to the extent that he, uh, like in uh, his designed courses are still taught in Myanmar, in Yangon University. So he had, and he had a strong uh, influence on Indian art because he was trying to show uh, that uh, when you have Mauryan court art at the same time, you cannot neglect the popular arts. So this person, he was, and uh, he wrote this book called Bangali Ritihash, History of the Bengali People. And interestingly, he wrote this book while he was in prison during the time of the freedom movement. Uh, so he, uh, he published this book in 1949, but the larger part was written in the prison, and therefore this is volume one. And volume two, he never, when he came out of the prison, he could not finish volume two, so that never came out. And he was the first person to show in this mega book, and it has been translated to, to, into English. John Woods have done, had done this because it has huge followers. And he showed that when we are doing history of the Bengali people, Bangali Ritihash, history of the Bengali people, we should not restrict ourselves only to political history or to economic history or to cultural. We have to take into account the, the people, the region, the rivers, and the day-to-day -day activities. So that's how it is a pioneering work. So he, he draw attention to the fact that to understand the mind, the ways of being and behaving, this is very, the ways of being and behaving of a certain community. It is important to peep into the activities of their everyday life. Then only you can understand that how a community behaves. The way a Bengali community will uh, act throughout the day will not be the same with a person from a different community because these are different kinds of trends that we find experience in our own culture. So thus he chose various facets of daily life like food, costume, entertainment, traveling modes to draw an image of the life of the people of Bengal. So it was generally on the people of Bengal. Then we have another very important work, but not that much of uh, critically done by Shahanara Hussein. She's from Bangladesh. And she wrote this book called Everyday Life in the Palo Empire, uh, where uh, she was trying to construct the daily life in the Palo Empire with special reference to the material remains of certain sites. These are all monastic sites. Paharpur, Bikramshila, Mahastangar, these are all monastic sites, and of course, Nalanda. And she has taken into account the terracotta plaques and other things. Um, I have, like, her work follows the antiquarian approach to the study of material culture. So she is only separately studying the coiffure, she's separately studying the dress, but not trying to bring the entire thing within a historical context. So that is one uh, critique of her work. And then we, then we move on to thinking of everyday life which also includes urban life. So this, as I mentioned, the behavioral aspect of men and women. How did a man behave or what were the, that comes in, uh, into our mind that uh, in, a, in an urban setting, 
what whether the men or the women, whether the people were following the traditional norms and institutions, emphasizing control and regular kind of gender interaction, or did cities see the emergence of alternative modes of codes of private intercourse? So it has been argued that pleasure and culture appear to be the leading value that orient public behavior in the city, at least among the elites. And this has, a recent book has come out on this. This is Imagining the Urban by Shonali Kakaol. And she has used different, based on texts, it's absolutely entirely based on texts, and she has used different uh, dramas, different Kavya literature to show how the culture of enjoyment, which she calls the Kama culture, how the culture of enjoyment actually pervaded everyday life, urbanity in early India. But with that, there was also the cultural um, uh, affluence or how that uh, the idea of music, dance, all these things also was very important in, in getting, in giving our cultural, uh, in giving the culture of the urban, in, urban men, men and female uh, kind of a structure or a shape. <coughs> This is just to show you that how uh, in, in, uh, in terracottas, in, in plaques like that, we have, this is of course a depiction of, of an urban scenario. You have an elephant, people riding on elephant, people riding on horses. It's perhaps a kind of, this kind of processional scenes are very much seen in, uh, in this uh, kind of materials that I'm using. So you have, like if you can uh, see it, people are sitting there. This is actually the part of the procession. People are sitting on the top. Uh, in, in this case, I'm not going to the technical aspects, but in this kind of representations, actually the three-dimensional three part has not come out well. So you have in the same uh, pl uh, plan, you have these people who are actually sitting on, on a little far away looking at the procession. So this is a kind of an urban procession which happened mainly during the time of some festivals or some other kinds of <coughs> important events. So you can see the people where, uh, by if you look at the turbans, the earrings, and they, so they are elites who were of course protected by uh, this shades, the kind of umbrellas that they were using. So this is a very interesting depiction that we find from the sculptures. I'm not going to that, I have already uh, discussed this, but here one thing I would like to mention that among the, well, I've actually, this slide should have been earlier. When we talk about the kind of recreations or the uh, amusements or pastimes that an urban male could have. So here we have this example from Kama Sutra itself, where it talks that an Anagaraka participated in quail fights, uh, cock fights and ram fights forms a part of his daily pastime. Then you have his friends are there who are known as Peter Martha, who are actually um, supporting him whenever he's then and what he does he goes to nap and he how he amuses himself on all this I have already discussed a little bit so I'm not going into the details <coughs> but what is in important to note is that in spite of his uh, the kind of life of luxury or the kind of uh, the amount of sexuality which is there in the description of a Nagaraka the thing that comes out clear is the cultural accomplishments are also, it is, and it is a prime concern of an urban male that he should also know, he should read, he should know things, he could talk with somebody with a kind of an attitude and the knowledge. So this cultural accomplishment is a very important thing which was characteristics of an urban male and of course a female. In female, we have generally reference to Ganika, but a Ganika is not just an illiterate lady who is trying to entice an, a, a male. He, she should also be well-versed in the Kavyas. She should have very good uh, rendering, like grounding on the different kinds of musicals uh, that were prevalent in that point of time. So here, so en route, so this, I have purposely used this line that en route, the acts of pleasure are the acts of culture. So culture was very much linked with, in this period, with pleasure. Now I'm focusing on 
a, a site which is a very, which is a favored site of all the archaeologists who worked on Bengal. This is Chandra Ketubar. Here is the, yes. You can see the map is not that well uh, here. Why this is a favored site? Because Chandragatagar is a site, early historic site, which is on the rivers of the uh, bank of the river Vidyadhari. And it had given huge, from excavations, from our explorations, a huge amount of materials, terracottas particularly, and different kinds of uh, ceramics that has become a favorite with the Western world. Because uh, one or two examples I'll be showing, you will see the beautiful yakshis and the yakshinis, uh, uh, the uh, yakshas and the yakshis that are found from Chandrakitagar. And unfortunately, there has been last, I think, 10, 15 years or more than that, a racket who are replicating this kind of images. And these are being sold, to, uh, sold abroad to the outside world as Chandrakatagar material. And many of the museums unknowingly outside the private museums, they're buying things which uh, they feel that it is from Chandrakatagar. So it's a huge amount. <coughs> many people has worked in Kolkata. We have Sharmi Chakravarti from Deccan. She has done her PhD from Deccan College who has worked on Chandrakatagar, particularly the cer ceramics and others. And it is a very important trading site also because it is uh, on the bank of this river. And then it, you could link it to Tamluk, and through Tamluk, Tamralipta, ancient Tamralipta, and you could go to the Bay of Bengal. And um, people believe, actually, we have we are not yet sure, but it is said that it is the uh, Gange of the of Ptolemy, and um, that this was actually the port of Gange. We we are not very sure about it, but. That the site has immense importance is quite clear from the kind of artifacts they, uh, that has been found. <coughs> now, it has a vast repertoire of terracottas, but mostly many of the terracottas are like terracotta toys, giving us different kinds of impressions, then a lot of ceramics. So I have chosen one or two uh, plaques, which actually give you an idea of <coughs> the daily life. Now, if we look at this carefully, what we find is that this is, of course, a depiction of a very normal household, not a rich household. But here we have the person who is going out to for work with the baskets you have, you can see his basket, and the wife is there offering something in a bowl, with, uh, asking him to eat, and then you have, you can see the oven, you can see the oven, and something is being boil it's boiling, it's being cooked. So here you have a very interesting depiction of the household of a common man, and perhaps she is, uh, he is going out for work, and so uh, the scenario, actually the scene depicts uh, this entire moment of the day when the male of the house is going out for work, the female is offering him some food or maybe asking him to take this away when he goes for work, have his lunch. This might, might, could be the lunch box. You can, we can stretch our imagination a little bit and can say that this could be the lunch box, which, because he's, it seems he's going out. So he had his food. So now he's being offered the lunch box to take away and so that he can have it later on. So this is a very interesting description of a, of an, a moment in a household in the perhaps in the morning. This is actually uh, the description where uh, we have already seen that. I don't think we have to uh, re repeat it. Uh, so we have seen the oven, we have seen the storage jar, and perhaps it was a morning scene, and his posture and his legs suggest that he's on the verge of leaving. Yes, here art history helps us a lot. Look at the leg. So it's actually there is a sense of movement. So this sense of movement gives you the impression that he was about to leave. Now, in contrast to this house of a 
this little house, uh, the moment in, uh, in the morning which you have seen, we have a plaque housed in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. It portrays an elite family, the dignified looking male with a turban. I'll come to the picture, seated on the high back, or let us, let us go to the picture immediately, I think. It's not um, very, it's not of a very good quality because I've taken it from this book. But here you have the lady, well dignified, well dressed, and you have the men, and they have a child who is playing, who is playing. The family dog is there. So it is a household where the, and I think there are two, yes, the duck and the swan is there. The duck is there, I think. So it's a house which gives you the idea. It could be any part of the day, we do not know, but it's idea that Men folk is, do not have to rush in the morning. There's no rushing. It's leisure. It's leisurely sitting with the family and enjoying family moment. So this is definitely an, a household which is uh, replicated or described. This is the Chandragatagar. This is also from Chandragatagar and elite, uh, the family. It's a depiction of an elite family. <clears throat> now quickly, we will just um, go through uh, this kind the kind of amusements that we find which is of course another interesting facet of daily life we cannot think daily life is not always mundane we just work eat and sleeping so we have our moments of amusements moments of fun sports pastimes so urban man moments uh, all um, uh, intellectual pursuits as we could see from the description of uh, Nagaraka, the, they have their get-togethers. Common folk must have their own share of amusements. And when we talk, to, uh, talk of get-togethers, let me bring in one interesting uh, term that we find in inscriptions. And this term is Samaja. We have in Ashokan inscriptions the term called Samaja. And Ashoka is not very fond of Samajas because he says that we have to do away with Samajas because Samajas are a and when now we know Samaj, when we talk of Samaj, it's society. But at that point of time, the meaning of Samaj was not society. So when Ashoka talks about prohibiting the Samajas, he said that this kind of Samajas are not, not, not good for the society because here you meet people and you talk of different kinds of things which are not very palatable. So you should go for Dhamma Samajas because these are community gatherings and when, and Perhaps in these community gatherings, you get a chance to talk about different kinds of things and, of course, raise your voice also against the emperor. Also, if you do not like something of the administration, you're meeting people, you can talk that we don't like this, this is happening. So somehow or other, Ashoka prohibited this Samaja, <coughs> which is there in his edicts, in his rock edicts, is very much there. <coughs> On the other hand, just in the post-Ashokan period, post-Mauryan period, we have this famous Kharavela's inscription from um, Orissa, Hatigumfa inscription, where we find, uh, all of you know that it's a wonderful inscription where we get a day-to-day -day account. It's an, ev uh, sorry, year-to-year. -year. It's a year-to-year -year account of the life of the king, how what he did in this year, how what he is doing in the, then the next year, 11th year, 12th year, 13th year, like that. So it's a, it's a kind of a linear arrangement of what his activities were. And there he talks that he actually encouraged these samajas. He wanted these community gatherings to happen. So these get-togethers were very important so that people could meet, have fun and frolic. So these samajas were a part of the everyday life of the people and this we also can gather from inscriptions and from texts also so narrative when you look at this narrative plaques the plaques that i showed you these are the narrative plaques which gives you a story so this narrative plaques and these are very important sources for understanding social life so they also give you an, uh, they show that when we t think of social groups the different kinds of people that were there in the society so when we think of amusement, it comes that musicians were very important. We have this representation of the groups of musicians with their instruments uh, and others. So here you have, this is actually, uh, 
this this actually I have I have put this because just to so, show the con conjugality and how um, actually people uh, sometimes uh, these are depiction beautiful depictions of pillars we have depictions of pillars these are architectural fragments parts of a house which could which were depicted in these parts but what is interesting to see the female dramas and you have lot of descriptions of the female dramas in from chandragatugar so they formed a very important component of the life of the people there Again, this is another. So this is the back side, and this is the front side. She is a dancer. It's a plaque where uh, she is dancing, and here we have a musical performance by perhaps a couple from Chandraketugar. you can see it's these plaques are actually not in a very good state because they were uh, some of them are in a very good state but not all i will we'll see one or two so if anybody of you happen to visit kolkata any time then you please go to the state archaeological museum and there they have an entire gallery on chandragatugar which is beautifully displayed and it's very nice and where you can see many things which are there in uh, which has been unearthed from chandragatugar so when we uh, look at this plaques the other things about the social life that we find is the harvest festival and this is also very interesting is that here one thing comes out very prominently because chandragatugar the kind of material that has been found from chandragatagar shows that it was not just a village it was not a uh, rural settlement it was an urban settlement because you have the trading activities i will show you some of the coins also from this region and different kinds of inscriptions has been found also small inscriptions written in kharoshti written in uh, brahmi or uh, as bn mukherjee uh, uh, mentioned that these are kharoshti brahmis there is of course a debate on that but uh, still those inscriptions are there which talk gives you an idea of the kind of things that were happening so in spite of being an urban center there was it it worked in very close conjunction with the rural so the rural urban divide was perhaps not very strong in chandragatagar and therefore we have the similar kinds of scenes it is it, uh, we have reference to harvest festivals in our literature of later periods also so here we have this is a procession as you can see and you can see that this grains are being actually collected and taken away by people so you have uh this representation the uh, elephant is there people it's a broken placket but when if uh, the the ladies are also be jeweled they have jewelries earrings and also they are having some kind of fun it is a, and we have some harvesting scenes also and this kind of implements we are using still now and those who are politically aware you will you know the cpm had this kaste haturi tara which we say that it was a it was a symbol of a common folk and the cpm has this as a part of their uh, symbol a political symbol so this is there the same things are some things don't change and these are still used by the agriculturist to like cut the crops and this is a very interesting plaque because it's so well uh, nicely actually sculpted <coughs> then i'm i i'm quickly moving in uh, to urban space when we talk of urbanity actually there are different theories when we talk of urbanity space i'm not bringing in that i'm just giving you some of the ideas because when we talk of space in in archaeological concept and also in historical concept we have this idea like when we talk of an urban center there are spaces for marked for different professional groups urban center always there are interactions between groups and here we find that metal working was one of the crafts that were being practiced then bead making was another craft lot of beads have also been found from chandragatagar area workings in bone and ivory then uh, then we have this beautiful uh, uh, photograph well let me sh show you 
where you can see these are stacks of actually ropes. People are making, yes, they are making these bunches. So you have the craftsmen here working on that. Jute was like na, coconut coir was very common this a, in area as we have coconut in the in the coastal areas. Chandraketugar was also in the coast in Bengal was famous for this region for coconut. So you have this kind of uh, coirs or ropes that were being made and this is an important industry. So you have depiction of these craftsmen working there in a, in a kind of an urban space. So in an urban milieu, you have a kind of a space where the artisans were actually working. And this can be found only from representation in art historical materials. Therefore, when we, I was, I was always, I always insist on my students when we study something, I said that, I, I tell them that when we are doing epigraphy also, uh, when I take the special classes on epigraphy, we are also, we have to also see that whether we have another other context to understand what is being said in epigraphy, which is also very important. Quickly, this is a beautiful decorative pot that has been found from Chandraketugar Tamluk area. Then you have, uh, I was constantly mentioning Tamralipti also because Chandraketugar was perhaps the feeder port for Tamluk, for Tamralipti, which was a very important port till the 8th century. We have the last uh, like mention of Tamluk, uh, Tamralipti as a, um, as a port or as a, uh, as a place in the Dutpani rock inscription, which is in the middle of the eighth century. So we have this kind of representations which you have seen. And when the uh, people, the ladies of the upper uh, echelons of the society are shown, we have very interesting depictions of them being shown with their attendants. Just have a look. Is, isn't she gorgeous, beautiful? And these are, these are the kind of sculptures that we have from Chandraketigar. These are independent sculptures where you have, <coughs> you can see the attendant. And attendants are always actually smaller in size. <coughs> this is one of the things that we find in this, this kind of arts. This perhaps the social inequality. Inequality was depicted through art forms in such a way, <coughs> the most of the times the attendants are smaller in size. And we find, I don't have the picture with me today, uh, we have this kind of attendants bringing in things for your own decoration or foods or others, even from early historic sites from Sanghol, for, for example, which is in near Chandigarh. Mathura, Sanghol, they all have this kind of ladies where you have uh, with them, they, their attendants are depicted and attendants are actually carrying objects or sometimes they're holding mirrors so, so the, the mistress can actually uh, dress. So we have these beautiful representations of these attendants from Chandraketugar. This is another one. I can, you can see the hairdos also. The kind of, uh, I, did, I did not bring this uh, picture, but there is a yakshis who has panchachura. You have five kind of hairpins. A beautiful yakshis from Chandragatagar who is also very famous. If you just click Google and say Chandragatagar yakshi, you will find that, uh, that photographs. So again, attendance. Uh, quickly going through the uh, idea of sports and uh, amusements and that this I have already, uh, yeah, just showing you the toy cart that has been, you all are familiar with lots of toy carts. So this um, I have been found. And uh, very quickly, if we say that, uh, look at Niharanjan Rai's work or what has been found or uh, descriptions that dice was very important and then uh, that people in, uh, enjoyed riding, galloping horse, Gajaturaga, was a, or on a swiftly moving elephant, was a favorite game of the royalty. 
this is very interesting because in Dhoi's uh, Pavana Dutta, we have this beautiful swinging by the woman that this was an interesting pastime and we have beautiful description that Dhoi writes that gardening or planting, watering betel nut and other things and plants in household courtiers and gardens was a favorite pastime for women folk in early Bengal and Dhoi further states that the playful women of the Shuma country, Shuma country is in the western part of Bengal, present day Bengal, would amuse themselves by including indulging in swimming and other kinds of uh, uh, aquatic sports and sometimes also swinging uh, in swings like Dola, Kelivas, uh, here you have the description. I'm running out of time, so I'm quickly going this. This is this I want to discuss a little bit because it is very interesting. This text is Dashokumara Charita of Dandin. And here we have this description of festival called Kanduka. It's a ball game. And this lady, uh, Kanduka Vati, and it Damalipta is actually Tamralipta. It is Tamluk, which is which I was just mentioning. And the, it's a very important port till the eighth century. And the text was written in, in around that time only. And we find that this lady. I'm not going into the details or the backgrounds, but this lady is is so well versed in this game of balls. So she just she can throw a ball like that. It doesn't fall to the ground, she can pick up this ball and again do the juggling kind of thing. And there was, the description is that there was an occasion where she comes there, she's a princess, and actually her suitor also is there, and the description goes on, where she comes and she performs it in such a way that people are amazed, and therefore her name is only Kanduka Vati because she was playing with this Kanduka festival, uh, Kanduka ball. And when it soars too high, she controlled it by moving towards it. And finally, she brings the ball to its original point and is large, hugely applauded by the spectacles. It's, uh, Dundin gives a very beautiful description of this ball game. And then that this Tamluk region was also, uh, we find from the text, was also visited by foreigners because in one place, Dundin says that there was a ship which carried Yavanas. And these Yavanas actually got stuck here, and then later on they were um, they were to be sent back. So by Yavanas here, of course, we are not meaning the Greeks because the Greeks by then the term Yavana had a different connotation. And so, like in earlier period, you have Yavana comes from Yona, so you have Yona, Yavana, and these are the Ionian Greeks were meant. Later on, even during the time of Ashoka and the postmodern period, we have the Indo Greeks, and then. Any Yavanas was a Greco, could be a Greco Roman, later on any foreigner, and in, in, in that period perhaps an Arab, or, but for the Arabs we have the term Tajikas also. So we do not know exactly what this Yavana was. He could be a Roman merchant, we do not know, but we have this idea of a foreigner coming to the port of Tamralipto, which is important, which shows that it was still active as a port. <coughs> so therefore, uh, this <clears throat> Dashukumar of the Charita gives us an idea of the kind of uh, <clears throat> ball game that was being played in the region of Tamralipta through the description of the princess Kandukavati. Next, which is very important for everyday life, dietary cultures. What do we eat every day? And here also we have, of course, from a later text, we have a very interesting description of the dietary practice of Bengal and um, generally poor householder was, as you know, rice was the main thing that one could eat. So husk rice made from freshly new grown paddy, liqu liquid card, leaves of mustard seed plants, such a frugal diet and so naturally it would cost very little. Then we have this Prakrita Poengala, which is a text and, uh, from the 14th century, which says that common pe food was rice with ghee, and then there is a particular kind of fish. This is it's a small fish, but a delicacy for the Bengalis. And it is says that that fish was always there in the diet because it is, and it has a different uh, angle to it because that, this fish is said to be very good for your eyes. So you have this particular variety called morala and leaves of jute plant. Now this jute plant were fried. They used to make a kind of a fried stuff with this jute plant and then eat. So this kind of description we have. 
And then from the Brihad Dharma Purana, Buddha Bratthama Purana is of 13th century. This is the, we have two Bengal Puranas. One is the Brihad Dharma Purana and other is the, I'm forgetting the name, I'll remember. So we have these two Puranas. So it gives uh, that one should have at first rice mixed with ghee, then vegetables followed by soup, etc. And lastly, rice with milk should be taken. And it actually follows the kind of food that the Bengalis eat. Even now, rice with ghee comes first, then vegetables, then soup is actually the dal, the lentil that is there. And then we have ra rice with milk means payasam that we have the kind of uh, the uh, sweet that we eat. <coughs> and it's very clear, salt must not be uh, um, mixed with milk, nor molasses with sour. But a very interesting description of a bridal ba banquet is found in the Naishadha Charita of the of Damayantis. This is by Sri Harsha, written in around 12th century. This is a text. And where we have this Damayant, on the occasion of Damayantis marriage shows that royal guests were entertained by treating them with various kinds of cooked fish, many types of meat dishes, curry made of deer meat, many kinds of sweet cakes, various kinds of sweet drinks, and betel. Thus, this lavishness of a royal feast stood in stark contrast to what the common man uh, ate. So we have this kind of descriptions from the textual literature. I brought in a little bit of the, an idea, because when we talk of society and at that, in the early medieval period in Bengal, the Buddhist biharas were also very important. And in the studies of the Buddhist Biharas, we find that we have description, because we have such good descriptions of the Biharas by Zhuangzang, I Ching, and where uh, also the diets of uh, the places were mentioned. So you have the different kinds of uh, description of what they were being given as daily provisions. So we find that each day Zhuangzang received 120 jambidas. Jambidas is a kind of a lemon, uh, round lemon fruit. 20 arika nut, 20 nutmegs, an ounce of camphor, and mahashali rice. Now, this mahashali rice is important because it is shali dhan. It's a kind of a uh, rice which is shali, and which was very famous in Bengal, and it was also very famous in Konkan. So we have inscriptions from the Konkan coast, which talks like the silaharas of Konkan. They have, they say that their best dhan is the salia, which is the shali dhan. So we, we can see that the coasts, they had this particular kind of variety. So we are very clear that we know that what kind of rights that they were uh, having during this. And then we have another from inscriptions also, another variety of rice called the boro rice, which is a wet rice cultivation and still continues in areas of Assam and in parts of area, uh, Bengal where you have the marshy lands and so you have this kind of a, a, a little bit of sticky rice which are used in uh, regions of Southeast Asia also. So that Boro rice was there, is also found from the inscriptions of Bengal and also of Assam. So this how the inscription also gives us this idea of the kind of things that were being eaten. I won't take... Uh... Oh, I remember the name of the Purana. This was the Brihad Dharma Purana and the other was the Brahma Vaivarta Purana. Which These are the two Upa Puranas which gives you description of Bengal. Yeah, I mentioned the source called Charyapada, which was of 11th, 12th century. And th these are songs, as I mentioned. And here we have reference to different occupations. So among this, we have a very beautiful description of a of wine selling house, wine cellar house. She's called Chundini, and she vividly described that how, uh, and it shows that how inebriation was co common. And what is striking is that, that these houses were earmarked with symbol saying that they were located within the general residential area, which means that when we have a residential area, there in some houses, there were certain symbols. And by looking at the symbols, you could understand that this was a place where I can get my liquor or where I can get my wine. And it's beautifully uh, said, it said, Dasami, dashami dwarat chinha dekhaya means dashami dwarat dwar means the door chinha you have the symbol dekhaya aila grah 
garahak upon a bahia. Man, on his own, the garahak, man, this is the grahak, hmm, which we when the consumer came on his own. So the consumer of liquor moves around. So you have a kind of a society, a social life, where actually a wine selling place is not separated from a different house where other people are staying. So it's part of the entire locality. So when you see the symbol, the grahok, the consumer, and this use of this term grahok is also very important because here you have this term, <coughs> uh, is, uh, bec uh, it's, uh, it's in the sense of a consumer and which is very urban. Like con when we talk of the presence consumer society or other things, that's a little different. But uh, this, um, I found this is quite striking when you, we have this symbols which are guiding the customer to the particular house. And the Shundini, the wine seller, she's the lady wine seller. She's sitting there with 64 pots of wine to choose from. The variety, look at the variety, 64 pots of wine. 64 is, of course, a conventional term because in other songs also we have reference to 64, but that there was a huge variety. And um, it is said that once you enter the house, you cannot come out, like you have to consume. So this was quite an interesting depiction of the social, uh, social life. Here, actually, this is a very interesting uh, inscription sh which shows the urban culture and the, gives a reflection of the rural life and how with money the rural life can be changed, like uh, the, uh, not the life, but uh, the lifestyle of the woman can be changed. And this, again, uh, when we do inscriptions, we are, uh, I'm always, we are thinking of the context. And here it is on the context of the land grants to the Brahmanas. Uh, this inscription is the Deopara Prashasti. It's a eulogy of King Vijay Shena, who was the, one of the most famous ruler of the Shena dynasty of Bengal. And here we find that this idea is that the king granted so much of land to the Brahmanas that the Brahmanas who were very poor and became very rich, now when they have enough money at their disposal, they, the wives of the Brahmanas are coming to the town. And then now they want to buy the different kinds of jewelry, the different kind of stones. But they don't know because they were so poor, they never had any idea that what the stones were. Now when they came, so the people, the ladies from the town, they are actually trying to make them understand, trying to show them that with an analogy from vegetables, because they are used to, go, for example, goat seed. This is white goat seed, they know. So they, when they show a pearl, they say that this is like a goat seed. How do you know a pearl? This is called pearl, this is from a goat seed. So you have a beautiful description. Verse 23, where you find that when the Brahmanas became wealthy with grant, uh, I mentioned this, that the simple wives who lived in villages had to be trained by the city bred women how to recognize pearls, emeralds, silver coins, jewels, and gold from the similarity respectively with seeds of cotton, leaves of a shaka. Shaka means uh, it's a green, uh, a plant. Uh, bottle goat flowers, the developed seeds of pomegranates, and the blooming flowers of the pumpkin goat creeper. So through this, you can actually understand the different kinds of stones, semi-precious stones. So this is actually a very interesting example where we find that here the urban rural divide is blurred and when with the money the ladies are coming to the town that how they are being trained and it gives us also an idea of the making of the landlords and which I'll be talking tomorrow a little bit, the Brahmanas becoming landed gentries. So with the amount of gentries with the land, they having some kind of money. Uh, I'm in the last phase where we have to think like daily life cannot be without exchange, medium of exchange. We have to use, have medium of exchange. And from Chandra this area, we have some very interesting coins these are the punch mark coins. Uh, then you have this ceiling where you have the depiction of a boat. So you have this boat 
moving away. And we know that at that point of time, there were a lot of trade with countries of regions of Southeast Asia. Then you have this, this cut of ceilings. And this is a very interesting Panchmark coin where you have, uh, you have a boat. If you can see, actually, it's, it's like this. this. These are the masts of the boat. So you have a boat. This is the sun symbol. And then I think you have a bird. And then you have, this is another very important symbol that we find in Panchmark coins. So these are the early coins. Panchmark coins, but there, this is the technique called Panchmark techniques. And these are the early coins. And there were different kinds of incuses. And within the incuses, the symbols are there. And these were actually a very important part of the trading network. So we had coins. Um, and where, where I will show you another. This is a small coin. But here you have a small a boat-like symbol. So that the people of Chandragatigarh were aware of the network, aware of the trade, riverine trade. So you have the use of boats. And there are different types of boat symbols that are being used in the ceilings, the, uh, the coins, and other things. So boatmen, boat um, exchanges through uh, coins were a part of the everyday life. And here, this is another plaque where you have, you can see this kind of perhaps long riverine route. They are moving. The people are in the boat. And perhaps a, in an important person sitting in there. And here you have the boatmen. And these are other people. This is a very striking thing from Chandragatugar area where you have, which shows that how coins were a part of the understanding, their thought, thought process. And therefore, you find that this is, uh, these are actually replicas of Panchmark coins. So you have the entire background where you have this punch of Panchmark coins. So that there was the monet it was there was strong monetization and it had a monetized economy is wonderfully replicated here and she is a goddess she is probably Sri Lakshmi representation of Lakshmi, because she is also standing here on a pot which is also full of wealth full of coins so here you have this uh, person she he is who is offering uh, some. Uh, Sweetmeats perhaps are there. And you have this description. And I was telling that you have this panchachura. This, these are the, actually, the for the headgears that this Chandrakatagar Yakshi was um, always seen in, in the five kind of uh, different kinds of headgears. So they have, it's a beautiful description of uh, perhaps Lakshmi. But what is striking is the use of these coins. And this reminds me of, I don't have it with me now, but if we look at Bharut sculptures, those who have seen Bharut, you have this famous story of Anatha Pindaka, that Anatha Pindaka was buying Jetavana for Buddha. And what we have in that medallion in Bharut, it's a cartload of coins, Panchmark coins again, which Anatha Pindaka brought, and it is true across the park. So it, the park had to be covered. So these, the kind of, in the uh, uh, sculptures, we had this kind of uh, the square Panchmark coins. A similar thing we find also in this depiction, which shows a society uh, which had a thriving monetization. And um, well, money was, imp it was not demonetized. Money was important. The cash was important at that point of time. But we had also there a parallel money, and that was cowries. Cowries was very much present in Bengal right from the early times to even the, during the time of the sultans. When the Bengal sultans had silver currency, very good silver currency, parallelly for daily transactions, cowries were in existence. This is just to show you the two different kinds of uh, the dress and attire of a common man, and of course, the attire of a no of an elite. <clears throat> this can be understood from the headgear, the kind of dhoti, uh, the lower portion that they're wearing, and of course, the jewelry. 
So finally, uh, uh, coming uh, when I'm concluding, I mentioned that um, in the Sadukti Karnamrita or in the text or Govindacharya's Arya Saptasuti, village woman, there was always, um, I should like to finish with this, that when we look at daily life, we'll, there was also urbanity, again, the rural settlements, all were entwined with each other. But again, there was um, a time when we have some kind of text like Govanda Nacharya's Arya Saptasati, where persons or people from the urban milieu was sometimes ridiculed and not appreciated. And therefore, we find that uh, he writes that a village woman should walk in a proper manner and not follow, follow the flirtatious gates of urbane women. In a village, this sort of flippant attitude is not looked upon properly by the uh, village head. So these kind of descriptions are also there. Then you have very uh, clear descriptions of husking rice, pounding of rice, drawing water from oil, well, all this. So what we find is that daily life in cities and villages, which I want to point out is that <clears throat> had sometimes contrastive characters and which is quite natural. Uh, we have to take recourse to the Buddhist text, the Sanskrit, mainly that we have taken recourse to the Sanskrit texts and uh, to understand to, uh, to, and which we find that um, uh, if we compare the Buddhist text with the Sanskrit text, we find that uh, the Buddhist text gives you more account of the urban population because they are more talk about the Kapatis, the Setis, who are a part of the urban uh, milieu and then in terracotta sculpture also we have different kinds of depictions. <coughs> Sometimes the, in the monasteries, we have terracotta um, sculptures where the daily, uh, the common folk is being depicted. So when we do, or when we try to reconstruct or understand this kind of, this part of social history, which is our life, so then we have to take recourse to not only to one kind of sources, and this is, um, always my plea which like uh, which i take from dt kosambi when he says that we have to do combined methods of history there has to be combined methods we are not supposed to like folklore and other things which kosambi did but for this here we have we cannot have the we do not have that kind of an um, source material till now but materials like um, Charyagiti or Arya Saptasati can be blended well with the inscriptions of the period along with the art historical materials so that we can have, a, we can understand the nature of the different kinds of sources. These sources are varied. There are many and varied, but within this, I, this pluralism, within these variations, we can actually draw a format. We can find out a picture. And that's what I try to do in trying to understand everyday life of Bengal. Thank you.